Okay, today we are going to finish off on Martin Zedek transformations. Uh, we're going to complete the theoretical treatment and then we'll look at an example of an application and I'll finish off by identifying a problem which is unsolved. Okay, so that it can stimulate your minds. Now, in the last lecture, uh, I explained to you schematically the phenomenological theory of Martinside crystallography. And in a previous lecture, I mentioned to you that when we factorize a deformation into its components, it is actually an imaginary process. Okay? It doesn't necessarily mean that first the austenite deforms like this to give us this shape, and then there is a second deformation like this, and then a third a heterogeneous deformation which cancels out this shape change. This is simply a mathematical factorization. All of these processes actually happen as the interface moves. So the structure of the interface is such that all of these processes happen simultaneously. And this is not necessarily the way in which, uh, uh, this is not necessarily the sequence in which the deformations happen. They all happen simultaneously. Okay? But by factorizing it like this, we are able to do calculations because the calculations relate the initial and the final states. Okay? Um, it's just a, just a screw, I think. I don't know where it comes from. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay, so um, when we observe austenite transforming into martensite, we see a shape deformation, which is an invariant plane strain P. But if I use that shape deformation on the austenite, it doesn't give me the crisp, correct crystal structure. To get the correct crystal structure, the overall deformation must be an invariant line strain. So to generate an invariant line strain, I have two invariant plane strains. That gives me the correct crystal structure, but the wrong shape. We don't observe this shape experimentally. Now, to correct the shape without changing the crystal structure, we give a lattice invariant deformation, which is not homogeneous, but occurs periodically on, on a certain spacing of planes, or a twinning with a certain thickness of twins, to correct the macroscopic shape of the crystal to what we see here. And this is the reason why the habit plane is irrational, that it really consists of facets on a microscopic scale, or, or steps of these kinds, uh, when you have twinning, of course, you are also creating these uh, interfaces inside the margin side. So that's not energetically favorable compared with the slip. However, an interface which twins can move much more rapidly than an interface which slips. So in general, when you get margin transformations happening very rapidly, okay, then you will get twin margin side. It isn't correct to say that you get twinning when you have high carbon concentration and twinning, no twinning when you get low carbon concentration. If there's a lot of plastic accommodation of the shape change, then the interface will not move rapidly and therefore you will have a lattice invariant deformation by slip. If you look at an iron 30 nickel alloy, then the martensite plate starts off extremely rapidly. Okay? So it deforms, uh, the lattice invariant deformation is by twinning, but as it transforms rapidly, you get recalescence. Yeah? What does recalescence mean? Yeah. Heating, on, uh, heating up the transformation. Correct. The That's right. So the enthalpy change accompanying the transformation actually heats up the material. So that slows down the martensitic transformation, and the lattice invariant shear changes to slip. Okay, so you can see a plate which is twinned in the middle but slipped towards the edges. Okay. So twinning is favored when the interface needs to move extremely rapidly. Because don't forget, you know, twinning is almost like Martin Zedek transformation except that you don't have uh, a crystal structure change. Right? And the entire theory can be summarized in terms of this equation where this is, uh, sorry, this is the Bain strain. This is the rigid body rotation which makes the Bain strain, uh, the combination of which makes the total deformation here an invariant line strain. Okay? And that can be expressed also as uh, a combination of the shape deformation, which we observe, 
and the invisible part, which is cancelled out by the lattice invariant deformation. So the lattice invariant deformation is opposite of Q. Okay? So what we've done in the last lecture is we've discovered what the rigid body rotation is. Um, in going from here to here, you create an invariant line, and there are two possible solutions here. We assumed that the lattice invariant deformation occurs on this plane, but you can make a different assumption and then do a calculation and work out you know, which is the uh, lattice invariant deformation which results in the smallest shape deformation because that will give us the lowest elastic strain energy and so on. Okay? So you write a computer program to do all these calculations. By selecting this as the system on which lattice invariant deformation happens, we ended up with two invariant lines and two invariant normals. And I can combine these in different ways to get four solutions for the crystallography of the martensite. And in the cubic system that we are considering, these four solutions are crystallographically equivalent. So I just showed you one solution by choosing this as the invariant line and this as the invariant normal. Yeah. Any questions? OK. So we ended up with our rigid body rotation, which if you look at the numbers, this is almost 1, 1, 1 here. And these are almost 0. So it's a small rotation away from the Bain strain, which gives us uh, an irrational orientation relationship in which 1, 1, 1 is almost parallel. 1, 1, 1 austenite is almost parallel to 0, 1, 1 uh, martensite, but not exactly. And similarly, the close back directions are almost parallel, but not exactly parallel. So we've got this part. Do we have this as well? What is this matrix? Tell me what the numbers are in this matrix. It's a very simple matrix. It's a Bain strain, right? So it'll be eta 1, eta 2, eta 3, right? So if I've got this and this, then I can work out the total transformation strain in going from here to here very easily. So this is our transformation strain. The rigid body rotation, the Bain strain, the shape deformation, and the this is related to the lattice invariant deformation because the lattice invariant deformation will be opposite to Q. It cancels out the effect of Q, makes it invisible. And given the Bain strain, we've calculated the rigid body rotation. You multiply these two, and you get the total deformation here. And this looks roughly like the Bain strain, because look, this is an expansion, an expansion, and a contraction. But it's no longer symmetrical. Why isn't it symmetrical? This matrix is not symmetrical, right? Any ideas? Yeah, do you remember the stretch and rotation? The stretch is simply an expansion or contraction along the principal axes. Yeah? And that is always a symmetrical matrix. So the Bain strain itself was symmetrical. But because this consists also of this rotation, it's no longer symmetrical. Yeah? So if you factorize this into a rigid body rotation and a pure strain, then it will become symmetrical. So this is no longer a pure strain. In other words, it doesn't leave three principal axes undistorted and unrotated. Uh, sorry, not undistorted, but unrotated. Yeah? Everyone happy with that? It's just a reminder of the process of stretch and rotation. Yeah? OK, so we've got, uh, we've got this part. And we've got the rigid body rotation and the Bain strain. And these two we now need to calculate. So let's begin. Uh, first of all, let's calculate the actual orientation relationship, because the 
FJF is the rotation from the Bain. We need to combine the effect of FJF and the Bain orientation to get the rigid body rotation. Now, do you remember the correspondence matrix? It tells you that you know a vector 1, 3, 5 in alpha originates by the deformation of a vector 1, 1, 3 in austenite. It doesn't tell you that 1, 1, 3 is equal to 1, 3, 5. It says, look, if I deform 1, 1, 3 and then transform its coordinates into the other system, then that is my 1, 3, 5 vector. Yeah? Everyone happy with the concept of the correspondence matrix? And this is a trick question. I'm asking you, are you happy with the concept of a correspondence matrix? Because I want you to now tell me what the correspondence matrix here is between the austenite and the ferrite. What will be the first column of that matrix? Okay, so look, look at this diagram here. So in, in deriving all these matrices, you should look at what happens to the basis vectors. Yeah? So what is the first column of that matrix? So if I, if I ask you, you know, what does the 1, 0, 0 direction of austenite become in the Martin site? 1, 1, 0. Okay. So, you know, whether there's a, a, an extension, etc., it doesn't matter. It does, in fact, extend here yeah, by the Bain strain, but it becomes the 1, 1, 0 direction of the ferrite. Right? So the first column of the correspondence matrix is 1, 1, 0. How about the second one? Minus 1, 1. Yeah. So this axis here is minus 1 and then 1 along here and 0. And the third one is trivial. Yeah. So that is our correspondence matrix, which is a combination of the Bain strain and then transformation of coordinates, right? So we've got the correspondence matrix and we've got the uh, deformation, yeah, the FSF that we derived in the previous lecture. So if I just rearrange these equations, I've got my orientation relationship, right? So here, you are. this is the Bain correspondence matrix, and we already have uh, have this matrix here. Um, sorry, this matrix here. So I just take the inverse of that, multiply by the correspondence matrix here, and we will get our orientation relationship here. Okay, so this is alpha j gamma. So if I if I multiply this by one 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 gamma, I get this here, which is almost 0, 1, 1 alpha. Can you see that? This is almost parallel to 0, 1, 1 alpha, but not exactly. There's an angle of about, you know, 0.5 of a degree there. And that's very important because that is what makes the invariant line. If you make them exactly parallel, then it's impossible to get the invariant line, and therefore you cannot observe the exact kojimo sachs orientation relationship ever with Martinsite, unless you have very strange lattice parameters. Okay? Similarly, the close back direction in this plane, the bar 101 gamma, is approximately parallel to 1, 1, 1 of ferrite, or bar 1, bar 1, 1 of ferrite. This is almost 1, 1, 1, but not exactly. Okay? So this orientation relationship is irrational, but we predicted it exactly. You know, if you do very accurate measurements, as they used to do using x-rays many, many years ago, then you would detect these small, very small deviations. OK? So we've, we've now calculated the orientation relationship, and we are going to go on to calculate 
the shape deformation. Right, so shape deformation. In other words, this matrix here, P, which is the actual deformation that we observe experimentally on a macroscopic scale. So again, this is our uh, equation that this total deformation, which is this, uh, the combination of rigid body rotation and vein strain is equal to PQ, right, here and here. And of course, I can take the inverse of this as well. And I'm going to write these invariant plane strains in this form. Yeah, do you remember this? Um, what is, does this give me a, a scalar product or is it a three by three matrix? Yeah. So you see, this is, I don't know if you remember, but I told you that this is just another way of writing an invariant plane strain. Yeah. Where this is the displacement direction and this is the normal to the plane on which that deformation happens, right? And if I was doing this for this, then this would be a plus sign. But I'm taking the inverse, which gives me a minus sign. So it's very convenient because to write the inverse is straightforward. Okay? Everyone happy with that? This is just another way of writing these two deformations here. Okay? This is the displacement direction of the shape deformation, and this is the normal to the uh, to this plane here. Now, one thing you need to be aware of is that the volume change is entirely in this deformation here. Okay? You know, it's an invariant plane strain which not only has a shear but also a volume change normal to the habit plane. This cannot have a volume change because we Otherwise, we would not be able to cancel it by slip or twinning. Because slip or twinning does not cause a volume change. Okay? So this is a, a simple shear deformation. Everyone happy with that? The entire volume change must be contained in this. Yep. You know, slip or twinning doesn't cause a volume change, right? So if you want to cancel out the effect of Q, which we don't observe, okay, very accurate measurements don't show that, then we have to, we have to put all the volume change inside this, okay? So all the volume change occurs normal to the habit plane, which is this. Okay, what I'm going to do is multiply both sides of this equation by Q. Okay, so here you are, that's the same equation here these two terms, yeah? This is the shape deformation and the lattice invariant deformation. And I'm multiplying both sides by Q, right? Nothing complicated there, is there? Yeah? Now, why is this equal to zero? So if I carry out this product, then Q times I gives me Q. Q times this gives me this term here, okay? Why is this product equal to zero? This is a row by a column, so it's a scalar product. Yeah, what, what, you're right. Uh, it's a shear, isn't it? So the normal to the shear plane is Q, and the shear direction is E. Therefore, Q dot E is zero. Yeah? So this term here disappears, and we end up with Q, this, this part. Uh, multiplied by, um, wait a minute, yes, that's right. So Q into this here, okay? So I then continue my multiplication. Q times I just gives me Q, and here, how, how come I've written this just as the vector P times a scalar? Because the front part, uh, yeah. Q times D will be Q dot D. So this is just another scalar constant, right? So Q times FSF to the minus one is equal to Q minus a scalar times P. Everyone happy with that? And just, this is just a rearrangement of exactly the same equation, yeah? Where I've got Qs on one side. And 
Therefore, because I know FSF and because I know Q, which is the 101 plane, uh, I've got my um, habit plane normal being parallel to this vector. Okay? Now, of course, that is just uh, the direction uh, of the habit plane normal. I now also need to find the displacement direction, D, to completely define the shape deformation. We know now the habit plane, but we don't know the displacement or its magnitude. Okay, so that's the next stage in determining the shape deformation. So here you have calculated exactly, uh, well, it's not exact because it's irrational, uh, but almost exactly the habit plane of Martin's site, starting with just the lattice parameters, okay? Because that defines the Bain strain. Are you excited? Okay. Right, so now we focus on the displacement vector because the combination of the habit plane normal and the displacement vector gives us the total deformation. So once again, this is uh, very familiar to you now. This is uh, simply the equation which gives us the total deformation as a function of P and Q. And here is the expansion of this. This is not an inverse, so notice the plus signs here. Okay? I multiply both sides by the vector E and when I do that, you know, um, I get, um, let me see now, E times this will give me E and let me see. Oh, it's multiplying on the other side. Yeah. So if I multiply on this side by E, then what's Q times E? It's zero again, yeah, because uh, the shear direction is at 90 degrees to the shear plane. So this term disappears, and you're left with E into DP, which is a 3 by 3 matrix, times E, which you can rearrange like this. Now, we know this, and we know this is 1, 0, bar 1, because we choose that as the lattice invariant deformation system. And therefore, you work out your displacement vector. OK? So that part is solved as well. And this will amount to a shear deformation of about 0 0.22 and a volume change normal to the habit plane of about 0 0.03, depending on your lattice parameters. Okay? So we've got a complete definition now of the shape deformation. Uh, okay, so we've got everything in our equations. Let me just go back. We've got the total deformation, the rigid body rotation, the Bain strain, and the shape deformation, so it's trivial to get this, right? Okay, so I'm not going to go into that. You know, if you've got all these matrices, then this is straightforward, right? Okay. What can we do with this information now? It's wonderful to be able to calculate all this precisely and confirm it experimentally, and all that has been done. But let's see what we can do an example of what you could do with this method. So I'm going to give you a very brief story which turns out to be extremely accurate of how to predict the crystallographic texture due to displacive transformations. And of course many people have worked on this in the past. Yeah? I'm focusing precisely on the displacive transformation because we are dealing with martensite, bainite, Wiedmannstein, ferrite. But if you look at all the papers, all they use is the orientation relationship to predict the texture. Okay? And some kind of a criterion to say which variants are favored by, by your deformation. But we have much more than just the orientation relationship. So we could actually discover more features of the texture if we use the crystallographic theory. So that's the aim of this second part of this presentation. We're going to work on crystallographic texture due to displacive transformations. This is a, a little review article dealing with all this. Now, you remember this slide where we have one austenite grain and we've got a vector 
across that austenite grain. This is as yet, it's untransformed. If I form a plate of martensite, that vector will be deformed in this way, and the average direction becomes V, right? So effectively, the vector U changes into the vector V by the shape deformation, and therefore, we write the shape deformation. Well, this is just a matrix, shape deformation matrix, displacement direction, habit plane normal. The vector V is simply given by this quantity here. Yeah? Because uh, we are not actually deforming the whole of the austenite grain, and that's why I've got delta U over here, P times delta U, plus the undeformed part gives me the vector V, right? So that's one austenite grain. I will, of course, in my material, I will usually have many more than one austenite grain, but it's no problem. I can, I can work out the deformations due to every single plate of martensite that forms. Yeah? As long as I know the orientation of the grain and the particular variant of martensite that forms. Yeah? And then I can add them all up, and this gives me the strain in a particular direction. Yeah? And I can, of course, work out the strain in any direction. It Does, doesn't have to be along, along U, right? Everyone happy with that? So I've got, you know, a thousand grains in my sample, all in different orientations. And inside each grain, I can form 24 possible variants of martensite. Some of them might not form if you apply a stress. Yeah, because those variants which comply with the stress, that means they cause strain in the same direction as the stress, will be favored. And those which oppose the stress, cause a strain in the opposite direction to the stress will not form, okay? So what I need to do, really, is first of all, I need to add up all these deformations. But I can't do that easily because all these grains are in different coordinate systems, yeah? So I've got to transform them to a single coordinate system, which is the sample axes. You know, for example, the rolling direction, the transverse direction, and the normal direction. Or if I'm just applying a uniaxial stress, then one particular direction and two normal coordinates, right? I can't actually start adding up vectors if their components are referred to different coordinate systems. It doesn't make sense, right? You can only do the addition if they're all in the same coordinate system. So here, here's the total deformation. Let's assume they're all in the coordinate, same coordinate system, and I have, you know, a thousand austenite grains, and I've got to do the summation of a thousand and twenty-four possible martensite plates in any single grain. Okay? Now, to do this summation, I need to express everything in one coordinate system. How do I do that? So if, if I tell you that here's an austenite grain, and here's a sample axis, how do I transform the deformation into the sample axis? So I've got a deformation in the crystallographic axis, and I want to transform it into the sample axis. How do I do that? Any ideas? Hmm? Uh, no, no, because that, that only gives you the indices. It doesn't tell you, give you the deformation. So I want to carry out the same deformation, but in a different set of axes. Yeah? Similarity transformation, that's right. So what I do is, you know, if I'm looking at a particular grain of austenite, K, right? So this, is, this represents the basis of a particular grain, K. And this is a particular plate of martensite within that grain. So J goes from 1 to 24. This goes from 1 to 1,000. Yeah? Then I transform the deformation happening in an individual grain into the sample coordinate axis. So this is the coordinate transformation between a particular grain K and the sample axis S. Right? Yeah? And this is the inverse of that. This is just the similarity transformation that we did in a previous lecture. Yeah. So that then gives me the deformation in grain K due to the martensite plate J in the sample axes. Everyone happy with that? Now, of course, you've got 1,000 grains and 24 variants in each, so you need a computer program. The algorithm itself is simple, but you need to do it 1,000 times 24 times. 
right? So when we've expressed all the deformations in the sample axes, we simply add them up and work out the strain, right? Where is the texture then? Okay, I'll come back to that. Um, we haven't done the texture. What we've done is worked out the strain due to the deformation. Now, in order to get texture, you also need to favor certain orientations over others. Because if all 24 variants form, then you will get a random texture. Okay? So what favors the formation of a particular plate of martensite? Well, it's the interaction of the plate with the stress. Just like when I pull a single crystal, the Schmidt factor favors certain slip systems, right? In exactly the same way, the stress will favor the formation of certain variants of martensite. Okay? Because the stress, applied stress, will have a normal component on the habit plane which interacts with the volume change, and it will have a shear stress on the habit plane in the shear direction which interacts with the shear component. Okay? So exactly like the single crystal deformation. Yeah? So I want to find out the total stress on the habit plane. Okay? Now, have you done stress tensors at all? Yeah? Okay? So this is a, a stress tensor. I'm not going to apply a simple stress, which is a uniaxial stress, but it could be a very complicated combination of shears and <coughs> normal stresses, right? So the most general way of expressing the stress that you apply is the stress tensor, right? Where these are the normal stresses and these are the shear stresses. Everyone happy with that or not? So what happens when I multiply the stress tensor by the normal to a plane, a unit normal to a plane? What is this? So here I'm testing your understanding of the stress tensor, the physical meaning. So if I take the stress tensor and multiply it by a unit normal and I get a vector t, what does the vector t mean? is called the traction on that plane, yeah? What does it mean? Any ideas? So how many of you have attended Professor Balad's lectures? Yeah, so come on, tell me the answer, <laughs> okay? Yeah, so, so what this means is this is a really beautiful principle is that if I have a particular plane, let's, let's say this, all right, and this is the unit normal to, to that plane, yeah, then the traction could be pointing anywhere. Okay? It could be pointing there. Okay? And it's a stress. If I want to work out the normal stress on this plane, then I resolve it along P, and that gives me the normal stress, okay? And if I want to work out the shear stress on that plane, then I resolve it onto that plane, and that gives me the shear stress. Okay. So it's a very beautiful concept that if I take the stress tensor, multiply it by unit normal of any plane, then it gives me the total stress, T, which is called the traction, which you can then resolve into a stress which is normal to that plane, and one which is parallel to that plane. Yeah? Is everybody happy with that? I might need to then resolve the shear stress here along the direction D, which is the displacement, uh, the shear direction. Okay? So there, there might be a further uh, angle there. This is the maximum shear stress on the plane, but I need to resolve it along the slip direction, right? So is everyone happy with the physical meaning of the stress tensor? It's a combination of stresses that you apply to a body, but you want to work out what's happening on a particular plane, you multiply it by a unit vector, which gives you the traction on that plane, which you can then resolve into a normal stress, which is pulling the planes apart, yeah? and a shear stress, which is causing them to slide. Okay. 
Right, so let's, let's do that now for Martin's side, where P is, you know, the habit plane of the Martin's side. If this was uh, just a tensile stress, then everything would be zero except sigma 1, 1. Yeah? So here we are. This is our, our habit plane. This is the normal to the habit plane. And therefore, when I multiply the uh, unit normal by the stress tensor, I get the traction T, which when I resolve along this direction gives me the normal stress on that plane, which is trying to pull that plane apart, right? Then I work out the shear stress by resolving it onto the plane. That gives me the maximum shear stress. But what I really want is this, uh, the shear stress along this direction, which is the shear direction. So the shear stress along the shear direction is the magnitude of T times cosine of beta times cosine of phi. Okay. So now I've got, for whatever habit plane I choose, I've got the normal stress and the shear stress along the shear direction, right? So this is, this is almost the same operation as the Schmidt factor, except we did it for a uniaxial tensile stress, and we've done it much more generally here, okay? Now, I want to work out the energy of interaction between the stress and the deformation. So let's focus on the normal stress first. What is the interaction energy between the normal stress and the Martin site? So I want an energy term, and I've got a stress. So in elastic deformation, what is the energy? If I, if I have a straight line between stress and strain, what is the energy? The area below the curve. Yeah, which is half sigma epsilon, right? where sigma is the stress and epsilon is the strain. But the half comes from the fact that this is an elastic deformation. But if it is a plastic deformation, then you've got simply sigma Ten. times epsilon. It's a, yeah? Okay, so what is the, what is the interaction energy here? If I just multiply this by delta, then that's the interaction energy between the plate and the uh, stress uh, for the volume change. And how about this? Yep, these are plastic strains, right? So it's simply tor times s. So I add up those two terms, and if that is a favorable interaction, that will be positive and the magnitude tells you how favorable it is. You know, if the plate is approximately at 45 degrees to the tensile axis, that will be a large interaction because the shear stress strain is much bigger than the volume change, right? Okay. So for each of the 24 variants, uh, this should be delta here. Oh, well, I don't know. On this diagram, it's, uh, it's this peculiar character psi, okay? So the interaction energy is given by that. And for all possible 24 orientations in a single grain, I work out this interaction energy. And if it's favorable, yeah, then I allow that plate to form. If it is not favorable, I kill it off. Yeah? So that gives me variant selection and texture. If all 24 formed, you would get a random texture. Okay. So now we've got a criterion to select certain plates of martensite, okay? But we've got much more information because to describe a single plate of martensite, we've got all this information. Okay? 
First of all, we've got the exact orientation of the plane. So you can calculate the microstructure. You can actually draw the microstructure. Yeah, we're not simply calculating texture. We are actually calculating microstructure. You can tell which plates are going to form from the interaction energy, so you can draw it. Yeah. Uh, you've got the shape deformation from which you selected the variance, and you've got the orientation relationship. And all these are mathematically connected. In other words, if you choose a habit plane, you've also got the orientation and you've got the deformation. So you not only calculate the orientations, you calculate the strains and the microstructure, right? So it goes much beyond everything else that has been done in texture. We simply try to estimate texture by looking at an approximate orientation relationship, right? You not only calculate texture, but you calculate the strains along all the directions and the microstructure, yeah? So here, here, for example, if I just have a tensile stress, then one, one strain is positive and the other two are negative. Depending on how many of the 24 variants that I allow to form. If I allow all 24, then you can see that the strain here is very small. Yeah, there is a small but finite strain here. What would that be? Equal to? This little bit extra here, if I form random 24 orientations, what is this equal to? Hmm? Delta, yeah, correct. And, and why? You, you're absolutely right. Delta cannot be cancelled, yeah? Whereas, you know, if I form 24 plates, one shearing this way might be cancelled out by another in a different orientation, shearing the opposite, right? Uh, the, the net effect of forming all 24 is to cancel out the shear deformation. But you can't cancel out the volume change. So you're left here with a little bit of volume. Yeah? But as I, as I increase my variance selection, the actual strains will not only be larger, but they will be anisotropic. Okay? So if you do a dilatometer experiment in which you transform to martensite under stress or bainite under stress, do not expect to see isotropic strains. Okay. Now, I think uh, during my last visit, there was a talk given by uh, somebody from uh, KAIST on anisotropic changes during dilatometry, right? We can predict them here. This is simply if it's a compression. Now notice that um, the shear component interacts identically with a tensile or a compressive strain, the stress. Yeah. Because it doesn't matter whether the shear happens this way or this way, right? You will have the same interaction. But the volume change will be opposed by the compressive stress. Okay. In the, in the case of steel. And these are just different combinations. This is pure shear, and this is hydrostatic compression. Okay? Right. As, I, as we have this mathematical set, we can also predict the orientation relationship, uh, the uh, crystallographic texture. Okay? So these are actual experimental data. And I wanted to show you one, one particular thing, which really bothers me a lot. These are the raw EBSD data. Right? And this is the output you get from the machine. Because what it does is it smooths these actual crystallographic data. So you lose a huge amount of accuracy by drawing these smoothed out profiles. Okay? Look at the huge difference that you have between these areas and these areas here. When you plot these color diagrams in EBSD, you are, you are actually smoothing out a huge amount of data and losing your angular resolution, right? So be careful with that. Do you see that this little, little set of spots here in the raw data become, you know, really quite a large angular spread on the stereogram because it's putting some kind of a smoothing function there, right? So try and avoid using these colored diagrams if possible, and go for the raw data. 
Now, the point that I'm trying to illustrate here, which might not be very clear, <coughs> is that, look, this is the experimental texture. And these are the calculated points here for the orientation, yeah, using all the theory that we've described. So you're able to predict accurately the texture when the plates of martensite or bainite form under the influence of stress. Okay? Can you tell me what I'm saying is wrong with my statement? So I've said that you're able to calculate accurately the crystallographic texture. Is this a fair comparison of experiment and theory? It looks pretty good, you know, the match between theory and experiment. But is there something missing in that comparison? So, so I'll phrase the question slightly differently. In calculating a texture, do you simply calculate the orientations of grains? Or even in measuring texture, do you simply measure crystallographic orientations? Yeah. I haven't predicted the intensity of the texture. I've simply predicted the positions of the grains on the stereogram, right? So unless I can actually predict the volume fraction of the favored variant, I can't predict the intensity. And if you look at all the past papers on this subject, you won't find them predicting the fractions. Okay? They simply plot the locations, the crystallographic locations of the predictions, not how intense those poles are. Okay? So, you know, here if I had only one dot, that would still be consistent with the correct orientation. But I have many, many dots here, right? I'm not predicting the volume fractions of particular variants. So that's a major shortfall which hasn't been solved yet. OK? So we need not only to predict the orientations of the crystals, but also how many of those crystals and what fraction of the total they occupy. Uh, OK, but we can calculate individual orientation change. Yeah. It means and if we sum them, then maybe we might be able to get the pressure. Right. But supposing that uh, one plate of martensite in the austenite grain yes. is only this big, all right, and another one is much bigger, in the calculation, these two give me the same points. Yeah? So that, that's a problem for you guys to solve, okay? 